Welcome to this week's edition of The Lindsay Elmore Show. Today, we are going to be talking about overcoming obstacles in pursuit of your passions with Joy Womack, an artist for the Boston Ballet. After that, we'll be talking with three small business owners about how to collaborate with friends and find success. We'll be talking with Chelsea Tenney from Put On Love Designs, Haley Crowley from Whimsy and Wellness, and Kate Lyons from Modern Makery about how to make it all work. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. If you like it, please share it with your friends and send us a comment, a suggestion, or a question at lindsayelmore.com slash podcast. Now, let's go talk to Joy. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. In today's episode, we are talking all about turning creative passions into our life's work. Joy Womack accomplished her childhood dream and became one of the first American women to ever graduate from the Bolshoi Ballet Academy. She became only the second American woman in history to dance with the Bolshoi Ballet, but not all was rosy. In 2013, she left the Bolshoi citing extortion, cruelty, corruption, and a culture that fostered potential for sexual abuse. Nevertheless, she persisted. She traveled to South Korea to dance for the Universal Ballet Company, and she now dances for the Boston Ballet. Joy Womack, welcome to the Lindsay Elmore Show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you today because I think that one of the most difficult things that women go through is when we get face-to-face with things that we don't know and things that we didn't know we didn't know. You came face to face with your own naivete and you had to very quickly and very rapidly outgrow your childhood dreams in a very, very public way. But yet you've stayed true to your desire to be a ballet dancer. Why do you have this drive and how, despite setbacks and burned bridges and shaking confidence, do you stay on the path of, I am going to dance ballet? How timely is your question? I think uh, for me, especially in the middle of those kind of moments, you need to ask yourself, what is your why? Mm -hmm. And if that why is still outweighing the the external factors that are getting in your way then you have to keep pushing through Mm -hmm. and i like to play the game what if i did give up and in five years how would i feel about that Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. i try not to send myself a lever that i wouldn't want to open in the sense of what are my actions today doing and saying to my later older self. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not easy to, to have your rolled rose colored glasses come off and see things and, and the situation for what they are. But if your core values and what your dreams are still aligned, then you have to keep walking uh, with faith and trust that you're meant to be there. Mm -hmm. and that there's something to be gained and learned from the whole process. That's so profound because it's like Mark Nepo says, what if everything in your life is happening exactly like it should be? And yeah, you went through some tough times, but you used it in a way to, to learn from it and grow from it. And so in those most difficult of moments, what did you decide was your why that kept you propelling forward? I had to go back to something very primal Mm -hmm. in a sense of the ability to listen to music and have your heart and your soul stir. Mm. And now what is the feeling that you get 
when you hear that music? Is it still a desire to dance? And going back to that base primal fact daily, even when you are walking through abuse or having to face people who don't like you or having to face someone that has hurt you, when you have that belief and that love for what you do and for the people who you're standing up for, it's enough to keep you going. Well, and speaking of standing up, I mean, in a way, even though you had to go through something really difficult with the Bolshoi Ballet, at least you had a voice. You had the opportunity to share your story far and wide. I mean, articles in Time Magazine, the New York Times, like really huge publications. But most women do not have that opportunity. And so what advice do you have for young women who are pursuing creative professions? What do they look out for and how do they exert their power even in some of these difficult situations? Like you had no idea that you were going to be put through this. So what advice would you give to a young girl who is pursuing her her most creative desire? Well, the first thing is you need to expect that there are going to be bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. There is never going to be an oasis of perfect harmony, harmony in a utopia. So an acceptance that difficulties are inevitable, but being clear with what you see as a violation of your of your integrity, mm -hmm. of your person, and I think that the key is to stay close to your true integrity and your message that you're trying to say. So if you know with a clean conscience that you're doing everything you can in your power to do the best every day, and that's coming under fire and who you are as a person in this in physical space is being is being egregious there comes a moment where even speaking up doesn't become something that how can i say this is this is a very difficult question mm -hmm. um, i want to say that that experience with the bolshoi i was just in the right place, right time. And I very much uh, understand that that story that was being told was being told because somebody needed it to be heard. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is knowing when to say yes and when to say no. Mm -hmm. Judgment. Um, and it doesn't get easier. It. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you spoke about it, you're only going to come under more fire. So asking yourself the question, what, what is worth it for you? Mm -hmm. And I think that from a very young age, um, having to deal with abuse and, and things like that, um, I've always had this innate hope and desire for all of the women mm -hmm. to be able to know their worth because so often that is violated. Yes, and and you know, you were not a 35-year-old woman going through this. You started at the Bolshoi Ballet Academy when you were just 15 years old. I mean, you were young. You went through this very well, very young. I want to I want to reiterate something because it's very easy to play the blame game and to mm -hmm. say that this only happens at the Bolshoi. It just so happened at the Bolshoi. This is mm. an endemic that happens systemically in the ballet world. Absolutely. And I will not be silent about it. It happens in companies here in America. It happens in Europe. It happens in small companies and in big companies. Mm. And just because a company is overseas in Russia, it's so easy to paint them in, uh, in a bad light. Whereas today, some of my best friends in the world and one of my favorite companies is still the Bolshoi Ballet. I love the Bolshoi Ballet. Mm. I love the people there, the system, the dancing, the quality of the product that's produced. It just so happened in that season when I was there, there was a, there was a bad apple. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
that 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 uh, regime is now changed. Um, mm-hmm. There are there are still aspects of that, but there are aspects of that even more rampant here in America today. Yeah, and I don't know how comfortable I feel with sharing that, but you know, one of the things that I face right now is is do I keep going even when I keep coming up against the same the same issues? We mm-hmm. have men in this company. Uh, excuse me, we have men in this country who are in positions of power who think they can dictate the way a woman takes care of her body. Mm-hmm. And it just raises questions because it's, it's, it's hard to um, submit yourself to almost as, as if a man is explaining you how to exist in a woman's body. And that, um, that to me is, is really hard to make peace with because I don't yeah. think that is right. Well, and you are so right. And it's not just within the ballet world. I mean, we have talked to women in technology, in finance, all across hundreds of different industries. And you are right. Women are put in positions where someone else gets to tell us how to live. And that is just a crazy, crazy thing that we perpetuate, not just in one industry, but across all different kinds of industries. And so what the heck do you do? How do you exert your power? And how do you how do you personally aim to reclaim and really own that power? Well, I mean, I think that we are at a at a transition point as a Mm -hmm. society and a culture. And I'm very grateful that I get to do what I do in this day and age, because at least we're having a conversation about it. Yes. Uh, but again, I think it goes back to doing the best that you can do daily and understanding that the system is flawed mm-hmm. and drawing attention when necessary to things that are egregiously illogical and not right. Yeah. I, I really think that, oh goodness, women can perpetuate the cycle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I agree. Because we learn the system and then we create the system to teach new abusers. Yeah. And I think it's important to treat one another, regardless of the sexes, with respect Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, and I think that also when there is a system in place that women are then put in that position of like, oh my gosh, this is the way it is. And if I want to survive, then I have to go along mm-hmm. with it. And I think that we see that. I mean, it's it's the very basis of the entire Me Too movement is, hey, we're over here making movies and we just want to do it without the risk for sexual abuse and we want to get paid equally. I mean, it doesn't seem like it should be difficult, but for some reason it is. Because we're saying no to in, an entire belief system, mm. an operating system that doesn't exist to put women on the same plane as men. Mm, mm. But I think it goes beyond the gender conversation. It's we, especially in the creative, if we're talking about the creative field, Absolutely. There's, a, there's a culture of, well, they're, you're replaceable. Mm. And that comes from a value system of you are not good enough as you are. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There is someone else out there that's better than you. So if you don't get your act together, if you don't toe the party line, you will be replaced. Mm-hmm. You are forgettable. And it it feeds on our fear-based pain body system. Mm-hmm. Because we have rejected a system of, of belief that we are beautiful, we are wonderful, we are we are of the creative energy, we are, you know, women, we are nurturing. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it also, especially like, I mean, even watching television programs with um, young girls dancing, you hear their instructors tell them everyone's replaceable. And these are 
eight-year-old children. And so it does feed on that fear of like, holy crap, what what if I'm not good enough? And so mm. what do you do to build resilience in these systems and how do you remind yourself that you do have inherent value that you do deserve to make a fair wage that you do deserve a safe workplace and how do you craft that culture just one person at a time well i would be telling a big fat lie if i didn't say i have a beautiful support system Mm -hmm. i have a wonderful father who is a cheerleader Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are don't have that. Mm-hmm. And so how can we create that for people who don't have it? Mm-hmm. How can we be that support system for one another? And, you know, and I can't tell you how many times I've called my dad in tears saying, mm-hmm. I can't do this anymore. I, you know, yet again, I've been, you know, violated or, you know, somebody has manipulated me or, or falsely led me to believe that this was going to happen. And he, you know, he'll just keep getting up, keep, you know, and, and, and it's so good to have somebody to, to be able to say like, Hey, do you think this is right? Or am I just, am, am I not seeing the full picture here? Mm-hmm. And, and then doing your pros and cons list, having your weighted scales. Um, because in some instances it's, it's time to be quiet and sit down and take it. And in some instances, no. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really difficult because, what you say today has consequences on tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially for you. I'm sure you still live that out and have that question of like, did you do the right thing? You know, daily, daily. Yeah. And I mean, I even so much so that even, you know, my parents as recently as last week, was like, Joy, what are you doing in this industry? Mm. When are you going to choose happiness? And mm. I can't make peace with giving up my dreams. Mm. I wouldn't want my daughter or my friends to give up on what they love. Yeah. And, and I love so much the beauty of what it is I get to do. And I recognize that it is such a blessing that I'm willing to deal with a lot of the the things that, that detract from it Mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm hoping that there will be a day where I can be in a position to stop the cycle, Mm -hmm. to lift other, other, other artists up, to give people a platform to do what it is that is in their heart. Mm-hmm. We examine our hearts and our our desires instead of power moves. What is going to make me more famous? What is going to make me more, you know, I need somebody else to tell me that I'm valuable. Mm-hmm. Let's put the focus on you. What is it that makes you feel valuable to you? Yeah. And that's changing the game. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've really highlighted a lot of the emotional stress that goes into pursuing not only ballet, but any creative pursuit. But there's also a huge physical stress that goes on ballet dancers. Ballet dancers are almost notoriously unhealthy people. You know, we've seen ballet dancers that just survive on caffeine and cigarettes. There's the there's the actual toll on your body that goes into the craft. And perhaps more so than any other industry, there is a pressure to look a certain way and you cannot deviate from that look. Um, And it has to take a toll on you. So what have you learned over the years that you must do to take care of yourself, body, mind, and spirit? Well, I would be sitting here lying to you, telling you that, that, you know, every dancer out there is okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. You have good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. And we work with a mirror. We work with the judgments of others, unfortunately. And sometimes your worst critic is yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I personally have struggled so hard with those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think now I'm working with the idea that life is a cycle and you need to be okay with ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And you're where you are, where you need to be, because that's, that's what needs to happen right now. 
So make peace with it and walk through it, even though it can be difficult to look yourself in the mirror, put on your clothes or put on your tutu, put on the makeup that you need to do. But just trusting that this is for right now and whatever is coming tomorrow, that's going to come to that's going to come tomorrow. And so mm-hmm. dealing with if, for, if we're talking about pain management, it's <clears throat> taking stock in the morning, uh-huh. checking in with yourself and having a constant conversation with, okay, where am I at here pain wise? What can I be doing to manage that? Okay. Why could I be feeling like that? Is it because I've neglected to ice for the past three days or is it something that is brewing? Do I need to go and check in with somebody? Um, okay, I need to really be making sure that I'm getting good and better quality sleep because I'm just feeling super drained right now. Um, and and not going out, not drinking, you know. Mm-hmm. For me, I personally choose to eat a vegan diet and to um, not have any gluten. Um, I take a lot of supplements. So it's just like finding what works for your body to feel fueled in the right way, but mm-hmm. also manage just the different demands that you need to be doing so in different seasons of my life i've had different demands like for example uh there was a year where i did almost three months consecutive dancing touring Mm -hmm. so that was like two performances a day and we were almost living on a bus Mm -hmm. and i mean i could not keep enough food in me Mm -hmm. to maintain my weight i lost so much weight and after that i had to spend like three months recovering from it um, and sometimes that doesn't that doesn't catch up with you until much later. Mm-hmm. So it's it's important to understand that you can't steal from yourself because mm. you're going to eventually have to pay the piper. So it's more about the daily choices that you're making because that's going to affect who and what you're doing two months down the road. Yeah. Um, and again if your body is your tool, you better have a team to help you take care of it. Yeah. Because sometimes we are our worst enemies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just thinking about doing two shows a day just sounds so exhausting. Um, It was so fun. Oh, was it? I miss it. it. I'm in a season in my life where I'm not doing that uh, as much now. And I really have realized that I miss, miss that. Mm -hmm. that that part of myself so it's interesting I have to keep telling myself this is a season you're you're learning things here now like don't worry like if if that's in your cards it'll come back you know so it's it's just it's, it's hard to not beat yourself up while you're down Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I think it's one of the hardest things that we do is actually valuing ourselves at all different parts mm-hmm. of our lives. So, well, before I let you go, you ready for some lightning round yes, questions? Yes. Okay. Bring it. All right. What is your number one strength? Wow. Okay. I think perseverance. I, I think I can definitely see that for you. I would use that word to describe the journey that you have been on. And I, I think that that is one of the things that is necessary for people that actually try to turn creative arts into making a living. You have mm-hmm. to have perseverance because you're going to hear a lot of no's and you're going to hear a lot of like, you're not good enough and, you know, just... Going back to yet another audition again, all of that's tough. Um, what is the thing that you struggle with? Knowing if I'm actually going to do what it is in my heart. Like, I guess you could say like the fear of not fulfilling my purpose. Oh, wow. I think probably a lot of women will resonate with that. Um, if you could give advice to your younger self, what would it be? Guard your heart. Mm. Mm-hmm. Don't give up. Yeah, that perseverance coming back. What keeps you up at night? Wanting to do more for those that are coming. 
behind mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Well, I I think I I think maybe you don't give yourself enough credit because I think that by sharing your story so authentically, and I've really enjoyed talking to you today because of how much vulnerability you're willing to put out there. Um, maybe and, it's still naivety, but it's the, <laughs> it's the way that I decide to go through life now. <laughs> yeah, just you've got to make those decisions um, going forward. Um, who is your greatest inspiration? My mother. Yeah, why is that? <laughs> she uh, is a Harvard-trained physician mm-hmm. who had nine children and gives daily. And I, I mean, it's it, I have so many people who inspire me, but yeah, just looking at the way that she's able to care for the people while breaking barriers in the medical field and mm-hmm. being one of the smartest people I know. Um, she w- she literally gave a kidney to her best friend. Like that's <laughs> how selfish she is. Wow. So if I could be one fourth of the woman that my mother is, I'd say that. I think that's enough. <laughs> what a huge blessing to have such great parents who love and support you, and mm-hmm. to have a big family as well. So, yeah. last but not least, God to you is my everything. Hmm. Oh, Joy, it has been an absolute just honor and privilege to talk to you. Thank you for sharing your heart with us. Um, If anyone is interested in learning more about Joy, you can find out more from her on her website. It's www.joywomack.com. And if you're in the Boston area, go and check her out at the Boston Ballet. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you for having me. Turning your creative passions into a viable business may seem like a daunting task. You may not know how to identify your audience, create a product that you can sell to them authentically, or how to run your business like a business. That's okay. Everybody has to start somewhere. That's why I created an easy to understand five-step guide to becoming an entrepreneur. You can access the free guide by heading to www.lindsayelmore.com slash five steps. That's www.lindsayelmore.com slash the number five steps. Chelsea Tenney, Haley Crowley, and Kate Lyons, thank you so much for coming and being guests on The Lindsay Elmore Show. Hi, thank you for having us. I'm so excited to talk to you because I am inspired by how you guys turned something so organic into a collaboration. And there could have been so much competition. And in reading all of your information, one thing that became very clear to me is how much each of you value community over competition. So Chelsea, just start us off. Tell us why that is so important to you. Um, Well, we basically, especially with our little tribe here, we like, we all have our own little areas that we fill all the essential oil needs. So that was like super easy right off the bat. But, you know, we all started our businesses and have been copied lots of times and it hurts, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was just so nice to find a community that we all could just value each other's ideas. And it was just super inspiring. So Haley, what do you think? What is it about having a community of women to work with that's so valuable for you? Um, I, so Chelsea, we've all talked about this a lot. So I definitely agree with what Chelsea said. Um, I think being able to work with other women, especially when you work from home by yourself, you're running your own business, you're alone most of the time Mm -hmm. and it gets really isolating. And so we're like Marco polling each other all day and texting each other all day and asking for opinions on things. Cause a lot of times too, you're running your own business. You think that you're making the right decisions, but if you don't have anyone to ask, it's really hard. And so having their opinions also feels like you can make better decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And I I agree with you. I think people think that being an entrepreneur is so glamorous. And really, it's like, no, no, it just means you sit by yourself at your computer a whole (laughs) heck of a lot. So each of you runs a small business. 
out of your home, you're juggling the um, the needs of your family, your own personal needs. So, Kate, what have been some of the lessons that you have learned about running small businesses? Oh, it depends on the day. It's something new every day. <laughs> yeah, so I bet. There's like small learning curves on just like literally logistically, how does it all fit in the day? And then there's big things on like, how do I financially make good choices that benefit my business, but don't Mm -hmm. put my family at stake. So Mm -hmm. it's learning to take a plunge when you need to take a plunge and to hold back when the, all of the wisdom around you is saying, this is probably not a good choice right now. So it's just a matter of juggling the big decisions and the little ones and hoping that it doesn't give you a nervous breakdown. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and, you know, today's episode is all about how do we turn our creative passions into life's work. And I'm wondering, I'm curious, anybody can take this question. How do you think that the collaboration between all of you has helped to further your business? Because like I said, you guys could have easily seen each other as like, oh, we're, we're all kind of in this same realm, but you decided to link arms and go forward and not be in competition with one another. So how does this help you to achieve that big overarching dream of like, this is what I love to do and I'm going to make a living and support my family doing it? I think we all have different skills that complement each other really well. Mm -hmm. And for example, I cannot sew and Kate Mm -hmm. hand sews every bag. So there's no way I would ever be able to create what she's created. Um, And Kate really doesn't have an interest in creating bottles, but we all have really good ideas for each other's companies. Uh Like Kate has like said, I want this label that does this for my bottle, but she doesn't want to invest the time and energy to create it. And so she just tells me, I take that idea and run, and then she can buy it from me wholesale and put it in her shop. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's the same with Chelsea. We've talked a lot about crystals and how they work with each other and feelings and um, using crystals. It's a great way to wear them. And I don't have an interest in creating any jewelry, but that's her company. And so I'm like, I want th- I want to wear this for this. And so she's like, OK, and then takes it and then I can buy it wholesale and put it in my shop. Yeah, so I think that's one of the the best things is we all get to stay in our lane and really do what we love, but take each other's ideas that we wouldn't have thought of on our own. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. OK. So anybody else got any ideas about how this all this creativity and how you actually have worked together to become greater as a whole than you were as individuals? I think one of the things that people specifically in this oil community love is community. Mm-hmm. So the fact that they see women being leaders that are linking arms with other women is something that they want to support. So mm-hmm. as much as like the hive mind helps us, just the visibility of other women, seeing women support other women mm-hmm. is something that they want to get behind. So it, mm-hmm. just on the base level of they're doing what I want to be doing. I like them. We're like, I want to support them. Yeah. Just ultimately helps all of our businesses. So you guys are friends too and getting into business with friends can be very very risky how do you set boundaries to where you know it's it's you know it's like it's like Haley said I stay in my lane Kate stays in her lane Chelsea stays in her lane but you guys have to butt heads on some things. How do you manage those times where you do disagree and you go, you know, somebody has a harebrained idea and you go, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. You know, how do you manage those conflicts while still remaining and being respectful of each other as, as friends and as colleagues? Well, that's a great question. (laughs) I don't know how we manage it, but I think keeping the friendship first, like we, we came together to initially just like pick each other's brains and, and just kind of started this little group, I think through Instagram. And then we just kind of, we moved over to texting and Marco Poloing and we've actually been on trips together, just the three of us. Mm -hmm. And we called it a work trip, but we basically just hung out all weekend and it was amazing. Um, so I think we just like our friends first and then like really those staying in our lane. Like I love photos. I love like the creative, like anything to do with photos or the visual side. Kate's really good at graphic design. 
and Haley's good at everything. <laughs> <But> <laughs> and we just kind of all just like, she's great at like the words and stuff. So if we're kind of trying to craft something, it's like a no brainer. It's like, yeah. oh, Kate takes over on the digital side and like we all just fill in our pieces. And it's kind of like when you're working on a group project, like in college, like you're like, well, I uh -huh. have to get my group my group work done first before I can do my like other, my personal side of it. And so we all just kind of have that mentality and we're just like, Oh, got to get our, our stuff done. And we just work really well together. So that's I'm really kind of jelly. I like want to be in your girl gang for sure. Come I mean, you know, you know the, t the times that I've seen you guys working together, it's really, it's super inspiring because it just happened so organically. And so what advice would you give to a woman who has a creative spirit, but yet is not really running it as a business, doesn't really have any collaborators? Where do you start? Mm. I always tell people like, if you want that kind of group, you have to be, you have to start by being that person for other people. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, I really want the support. I really want this yeah. and that. I love the collaboration you guys have. I want other people's ideas, but it's kind of like, okay, but you got to put the work in. So yeah. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe it happens organically. If you start being that for other people, mm -hmm. it, it if you're choosing the right people, it's reciprocated. So it, mm -hmm. it kind of becomes a not a transactional relationship, but it is, I'm, I'm just as invested in the other two businesses here as I am in my own. Like mm -hmm. I put my opinions out there. Ultimately it's still their businesses and my feelings aren't hurt. It's like, I really think that's a great idea. And Haley's like, absolutely not. But <laughs> at the same time, like I'm, I'm putting it out there that like, if I'm putting my idea on something and telling Kaylee, you should really invest in this and she does it and it goes bad. I, my name's on it. So right. I don't know. It's just a, I don't know, it's reciprocal. Yeah, absolutely. And what about women who are discouraged? You know, I have been at vendor events and seen women just pour their hearts and souls into making DIYs with the perfect labels or perfect bag, perfect jewelry, perfect roller bottle. And then six months later, you're sitting on all this inventory, you've marked it down 75% and you just go, I'm still working a full-time job. I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. But yet, where do you find that drive after that bad event or after that bad product launch or after those emails did not convert like you wanted them to? How do you find the, whatever the word is, to just keep going? What, do you, what would you say to a woman who's currently just facing a ton of discouragement in her company? Well, I think we've mm -hmm. all been there. I'm just uh -huh. gonna say that, and <laughs> we have cried, and uh, it's hard. It's really hard. We've all had ideas that we were super excited about, and we're like, "This is gonna do great," and then you put it out into the world, and it doesn't, and it almost feels like a piece of your soul was just like crushed a little bit because, you know, like you said, you pour your heart and your soul into this, and everyone didn't love it quite as much as you loved it, and I think it's okay because you can take that and learn from it. So. Mm -hmm reflecting back on things is kind of hard for me personally. I like to like look to the future and like, well, what's next? What's next? Okay. That didn't work. Well, whatever. Let's look at the next thing. Mm -hmm. but what I've learned is it's so important to look back at successes and failures and think why, like, let's really look at this. Was it the product? Was, is there already something out there like that? It was mm -hmm. it not unique enough. Was it only a need for me? And maybe not for like, look at the product, look at the price look at how you marketed it. Like there's just so many things and really digging into it and taking that information and applying it to your next product or idea, I think is so invaluable. And I think especially when you're in that like crushed stage, it's hard to do that. So maybe yeah. just pause and let yourself feel the feelings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, when you're ready, look back and really kind of dig into it and see what you can do different next time. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say, starting a business is really hard. Running a business is really hard. I think especially at the beginning, it can feel really intimidating and you feel like you have to invest a lot of money or like all of your time or something like that, but you don't have to, you can grow slow and you can grow at your own pace. And mm -hmm. I think that was so important for me in starting Whimsy and Wellness. Um, 
if I sold something and I made a hundred dollars off of that, then I would take that money and reinvest it. But I wouldn't mm-hmm. invest two hundred dollars. I would invest that hundred dollars. Right. And, you know, and and we grew slower than probably a lot of other companies could, but it was really important for me to just not like overexert myself at the beginning. Well, yeah. and you were doing all of the own creative, all of your own fulfillment, all right. of your own sourcing everything. of custom boxes, everything. Mm-hmm. And so, and when you first start a company, you have to wear all of mm-hmm. the hats. Have any of you had any growing pains as far as like, okay, and mm-hmm. now it's time to delegate. Now mm-hmm. I've got to give this to someone else. All right, Chelsea, what, tell us about it. <laughs> oh, I would say, um, yeah, delegate, <laughs> which actually Haley is the one that's always preaching this to us. Delegate it. If you don't love doing it, then give it to someone else. And especially being a mom and running a business, like, there was just not, there's just not enough time in the day to do mm-hmm. all the things or do them the way I wanted to do them, you know? And so mm-hmm. I just slowly kept peeling things back and like, okay, someone else can do this. Someone else can do this. And then when something falls through, like you, you know, lose an employee or whatever happens, it's not as dramatic because yeah. it's like, there's enough pieces everybody's playing their part and it doesn't feel as overwhelming. Like if something Mm -hmm. goes wrong. Um, and that was just a really hard lesson to learn for me because I was just like, no, I can keep doing it. And then just getting so stressed and so overwhelmed. And Mm -hmm. it was like, I had to just start passing some things off. And I'm so grateful to find people that do them better than I could, you know? And, and I think like we were talking about, like Haley was just talking about, just keep showing up. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, you might have had a down month or even year, like, but just keep showing up and just trying your best. And it might be a slow process, but, you know, eventually maybe it, you'll find your niche, you know? Yeah. And if you keep showing up, doing the same great work and adding value to people's lives, eventually it's gonna stick somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So, well, I am so grateful that we got to chat um, today about turning creative passions into life's work. I'm so inspired by you guys being friends, forming community, allowing business relationships to flourish, and for really recognizing your strengths, your weaknesses, being open enough with yourself to admit those and say, you know what, I'm going to work with people who have different strengths, different weaknesses, and together we're going to do this bigger and better. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Hey, if you love modern makery, whimsy, and wellness and put on love designs as much as I do, head to any of their websites right now and use the code Lindsay10 at checkout to save 10% off of awesome essential oil gear, diffuser bags, and diffuser jewelry, excuse me, and custom made carrying bags. So thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. If you have a big creative passion and are unsure where to start as far as making it a business, here are a couple of pieces of advice. Number one, if you are going to turn your creative work into your life's work, the first thing that you have to figure out is what is a problem that your creative work solves? What is the problem that someone has that your work solves. Do people need a new piece of artwork on their wall or perhaps they just need a bit of entertainment and just want to head out for the evening? Once you identify what the problem is, position yourself in why you are the perfect person to solve that problem. Think about what makes you different than all of the other people who are trying to get out there to get their dancing or their artwork out there. What makes you different? Then I want you to think about who is the person that will support your work? Who is the person that has a problem that you know how to solve and that values the work that you do? 
Create a support system. Be sure that when you have big dreams and big ideas, you have some amazing strengths, but you also have some pretty big weaknesses that are gonna leave your company open to failure. Create a support network and figure out what you need to actually market and sell your work. Do you need a website? What about a mailing list? Do you need to hire a graphic designer? Or is there a friend or a family member who could help you turn what you're working on into what you're earning money on? The good news is most of the time when you have a creative passion, the work is flowing out of you. You simply cannot stop it from happening. So keep putting your heart out there, keep being vulnerable, keep being persistent, and you will find a way to turn your creative passion into your life's work. The Lindsay Elmore Show is written and produced by me, Lindsay Elmore. Show segments are produced by Sue Procco and Kelsey Lorman. Production design, sound design, and editing is by Jive Media. If you have a question about this or any other episode of the podcast, send us an email to hello at lindsayelmoreshow.com. And hey, since you're still here, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And while you're at it, go over and follow us on Instagram at Show. This helps us bring the pod to more people.